Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mothers and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside, seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. And whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now there are questions that every teacher hears a lot. The first is, can a person who denies the Messiah ever come back into the fold? And the second is, what the H-E double hockey sticks is going on with Ezekiel's wheels? And the third is, well, what exactly is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? The third, if I can point out, is generally asked by people who are scared to death, that they've already accidentally somehow done it and have innocently damned themselves. But today we're going to look at exactly what Scripture says about it and how it is deliberate and rooted in religious pride. Hi, I am Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of Scripture with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah. If you prefer written materials, I have... Excuse me. Ooh, sinuses again. I know you guys are getting tired of my sinuses. Think of how I feel. <laughs> I have five years worth of blog over at the uh, ancientbridge.com as well as my six books available on Amazon, including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural context in a way that even kids can understand it, called Context for Kids. I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. You can find the links for those on my website. Past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com, and transcripts can be had for most broadcasts at theancientbridge.com. All scripture this week comes from the ESV, the English Standard Version, but you can follow along with whatever Bible you want. The book list that I've been using over the past 16 weeks now can be found over on my blog, on, um, on the transcript for part two at theancientbridge.com. Lots of books, adding to it. <laughs> fairly often. Actually, I gotta go back and check it and make sure that the new ones that I that I've been reading get added on there. They just sneak in. Now I read the whole rest of chapter three, but we're gonna divide this into two teachings, not because they belong apart, but because of time constraints. There's just too much material to cover. 
Mark likes to do this sandwiching technique where he places one teaching in the middle of an entirely different, te well, you know what, not an entirely different teaching, a related teaching. The teachings enhance one another, but they're different situations that happened at the exact same time, according to Mark. Um, examples include the healing of the woman with the issue of blood wedged between Jairus coming to Yeshua on behalf of his dying daughter and Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus, raising her from the dead. And the cure, uh, the other one is, um, the cursing of the fig tree, um, followed by the cleansing of the temple and returning to find the fig tree withered. Mark does this with related concepts in order to show a bigger picture. And in this case, um, that bigger picture is the misconceptions and rejection of Yeshua by his own family and by the scribes sent to Jerusalem. But this week, we will be focusing on the quote-unquote meat of the... It's all meat. Okay. <laughs> the meat of the sandwich, but you know, the inside parts. Um, namely, the Beelzebul controversy. Or maybe... Never mind. I'm not going to talk about different kinds of sandwiches. Stop it. I'm just hungry. Um, ugh. However, I will quickly cover the first two verses and um, hit them again next week. Verse 20, then he went home, who Yeshua, right? And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. Now, where have we seen this before? This is even more serious than when people were crowding into the door of Peter's mother-in-law's house right before he... Um, healed the paralytic. You know, when people won't even allow you to eat, that's just crazy. Uh, verse 21. When his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. So, <clears throat> his family comes from Nazareth. Presumably his mother and four brothers. Mary would obviously not be in charge here in that society, all right? Her sons would. Her other sons would, okay? Whatever honor or dishonor that Yeshua brings upon himself would transfer to his family as well. Know that uh, if Jerusalem is sending official legal envoys, the family would be scared out of their minds. If he is ruined, then they are too. David's family, King David's family experiences as well because they were not safe as long as Saul was hunting David. Okay, so not King David, <laughs> but they joined pre-King David, but they joined David. Um, they didn't oppose him. They joined with him, but we're going to talk about that next week because, you know, we keep getting all these tie-ins with the life of King David, with the life of Moses, with the life of King David, with the life of Elijah. Lots of messianic foreshadowing. Verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. Now, who were these scribes? And how were they different from the scribes we see in the first two controversies? First, um... Undesignated scribes were sitting in the house of um, Peter's mother-in-law, silently accusing Yeshua of being a blasphemer when he claimed that the paralytic sins were forgiven. Right? Because they were sitting in the house, they had obviously been given a seat of honor as educated men, because they probably didn't just show up first, right? Or maybe they did show up first and they got the good seats, but... We see no affiliation with these guys. We don't know where they're from. We don't know, um, you know, were they simply city scribes? Legal retainers? Were they local teachers of the law? Hard to believe that a town the size of Capernaum would need very many of those, you know, having only 1,500 people. Matthew 9 also tells the story, and again, 
It just calls them scribes. But Luke 5 says that both the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were in attendance. So there you go. So if we go by Luke, and there's no reason not to, um, they were teachers of the law who might have been Pharisees. In the second, or, you know, maybe they were just Pharisees there too, all right? Because Luke's not specific. He says they're both there. Um, but uh, they were teachers of the law who might have been Pharisees. In the second controversy, uh, the five controversy dialogues, concerning Yeshua's choice of table companions, we are introduced to the, quote-unquote, scribes of the Pharisees as an entity. But these aren't those. These are scribes sent from Jerusalem. This is the big kahuna scribes, okay? This isn't a local squabble or a local controversy anymore. This has gone national. These were the scribes of the scribes, the legal retainers of the Jerusalem elite, and quite possibly or probably sent by the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court of the Jews, in order to determine if they had a blasphemer or a quote-unquote seducer of the city in play. Let's look at Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.4, and this is out of the Kahati Commentary. The citizens of an ir Hanidachat have no portion in the world to come, for it is said, Certain base fellows have gone out from you and have misled the inhabitants of their city. This is Deuteronomy thirteen fourteen. They are not killed unless the misleaders are from the same city and from the same tribe, and most of it has been misled, and men mislead them. If women and minors are misled or a minority of it are misled, or its misleaders were outside it, then these are treated as individuals. And they need two witnesses and a warning for each one. This is more severe for individuals than for the many, for individuals are by stoning. Therefore their property is spared, whilst the many are by the sword, and therefore their property is lost. So, what is an Ir Hanadahat? It is a seduced city. A city where its inhabitants have been led astray into following after another god. Sometimes I actually wonder if this is why Yeshua left Nazareth and worked so few miracles there. If they had been labeled a seduced city with him as one of their own, they would have been in deadly peril. Capernaum? No. But in order to enact this, and to penalize a city for being seduced, there were actually legal requirements to be met. Multiple witnesses and actual warnings were given to the person or persons who are going after other gods. You couldn't convict people based on rumors or hearsay. It's very possible that the Jerusalem legal experts had been sent down in order to see if legal warnings were necessary and if this was a city in danger of becoming apostate. Quick fun fact here. It is always up to Jerusalem and down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was atop Mount Zion, and, all, and although Mount Zion would only qualify as a hill by the standards of most communities, and countries, it was, uh, it was honored by being called a mountain and given the place of supremacy. You always go up to it and come down from it, no matter where you are going. If someone was traveling from Jerusalem to Mount Everest, you would say, you would still say they were going down to Mount Everest. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> took me a while to get used to that. It took me a while to notice it. Now... And actually, I had it pointed out to me, so it's not like I noticed it. Now, evidently, the scribes felt they had dirt on him because they were making the public pronouncement that Yeshua was in league with Satan. And all of his deliverances were actually just part of some massive plan of Satan's to get people away from worshiping Yahweh. It's like the ultimate conspiracy theory. 
Is it, however, at all plausible? And who is this Beelzebub? And why does the KJV say Beelzebub? Well, the Greek clearly says Beelzebub, but in 2 Kings verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, there is a Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, which was a Philistine city. It would seem that, despite the clear Greek, the KJV translator substituted in this Philistine god's name as though it was an equivalent, which makes very little sense to me. But, you know, that kind of things happen. No translation is perfect, no matter what everyone says. Beelzebul, on the other hand, makes perfect sense within the greater story because if it is a straight transliteration from Hebrew, it means Lord of the House. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the word house, oikia, um, appears in this account like five times. That's a lot. Not including Beelzebul. Um, even more times if you uh, look at the references to his family remaining outside, outside of what? The house. But the Lord of the Flies, which is what Beelzebub means, it's really meaningless, okay? It doesn't add any meaning to this story. Now, the scribes from Jerusalem are accusing him of being possessed by the master, which is what Baal means. It's not inherently doesn't mean God. Remember in Isaiah, it meant, um, it was it referred to Yahweh as, as husband and master, okay? Um, so, they're accusing him of being possessed by the master, Baal, of the house, Zebul, and that he evidently has special permission um, to cast out demons in order to put on a show and lead people astray. Now, this isn't the only time he's accused of this either. And we see it in John 7.20, John 8.48, John 8.52, and John... Um, and um, in John 10.20 at the Feast of Sukkot, and let's look at all those different verses completely out of context, but we just don't have time for anything else. Uh, first one, the crowd answered, You have a demon! Who is seeking to kill you? Verse 848. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? 852. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. And then uh, John 10.20. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? But note that every accusation either comes from the people of Jerusalem or in Jerusalem. And I believe that the only people outside of Jerusalem who ever question his sanity are actually members of his own family. Um, and, and possibly the inhabitants of Nazareth, too. Strangers are flocking to him, while his own family and friends are, are utterly scandalized by his behavior and are undoubtedly worried that they will be labeled, that he will be labeled as a deviant, which was like a fate worse than death. As for charges of sorcery, those actually didn't, don't pop up until later in rabbinic writings, and so are probably anachronistic legends, which is why we don't see them. Uh, at his trial, certainly, you know, no one accused Yeshua of, of sorcery. I will only cite uh, the Talmud, Bavli, uh, Sanhedrin 43a, and uh, Bavli is uh, the Babylonian Talmud. Talmud Bavli is. Ta there are two Talmuds. There's the Babylonian Talmud and the uh, Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. It just depends on if they were written in the East or in the West. <laughs> All right. There is a tradition... In a Bereta, they hanged Yeshu on the Sabbath of the Passover. But for 40 days before that, a herald went in front of him crying, Yeshua is to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and seduced Israel and led them away from God. Anyone who can provide evidence on, this, on his behalf should come forward and defend him. When, however, nothing favorable about him was found, he was hanged on the Sabbath of the Passover. Allah commented, 
Do you think that he belongs among those for whom redeeming evidence is sought? Rather, he was a seducer of whom the all-merciful has said, show them no pity and do not shield them. Deuteronomy 13.8 In Yeshu's case, however, an exception was made because he was close to those who held political and religious authority. Now, this obviously isn't corroborated by any first century source and, and might have been penned as late as 600 of the Common Era. But Josephus certainly doesn't back up those charges. Not even in the uncorrupted Arabic that, you know, uh, some Christian scribes, they, they, they messed with Josephus. But the Arabic is pretty pristine. It uh, was a real blessing to find those and uh, not see the, the quote-unquote helpful additions. Now, no one ever says that Yeshua was politically well-connected or that the Sanhedrin was seeking advice or evidence for uh, 40 days prior or that he was accused of sorcery instead of blasphemy. As I said, although much information in the Talmud is legitimate legal arguments, there is also a lot of legendary material of dubious authenticity. So, two charges. He, one, he is possessed. And two, he can only cast out demons because he's in league with the prince of demons. And now Yeshua is about to give his answer in parables. There are actually two parables. Here's the first one. Starting in verse 23, And he called them and said to them, In parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided... He cannot stand and is coming to an end. Now, the first thing we should notice is that Yeshua doesn't refer to Beelzebul, whom he was being referred to by, who Satan was being referred to by um, the scribes as the prince of demons. So Yeshua used Satan, the Hebrew word for adversary. Yeshua went straight to the top, so to speak, or maybe to the bottom, depending on how you look at it. So how can Satan cast himself out? Isn't that contrary to his express nature? Didn't he exalt himself to the throne of Yahweh himself? Hasn't he been trying to win and never trying to lose? Is it in Satan's nature to take one for the team and allow his hold on people to be weakened. Let's take a look at Genesis 15 really quick and Abraham's encounter with the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom tells Abraham that he can keep all the money. All he wants is the people back. In the garden, the serpent doesn't try to take over the garden, but the people. This is what the enemy always does throughout scripture. He goes for the play which will win himself more and more authority over more and more of God's greatest and most precious creation, which is people. The battle of the ages between Yahweh and Satan is 100% about people. Nothing else matters. Satan doesn't take losses willingly. He isn't a general biding his time. He is a conqueror bent on conquest. But, oh, there's, oh, yeah, this is too long of a thing to, to get into now. But just think about um, all the different times in scripture where um, Satan is talked about. And he, he is in it to win it. He, uh, he's too arrogant to take a step back or to take losses. He doesn't do it. He wants authority. He wants that throne. He wants rulership. And rulership is nothing unless you're ruling over people. All right? So just remember that. Anyway, we will be back in a few minutes.
Okay, welcome back to Character in Context. I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and this week is we're covering uh, the Gospel of Mark, Part 16. We're talking about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And uh, can Satan cast out Satan? Oh. And we were uh, just discussing verses 23 to through 26. Let me read that again, because it's a parable, so it means it's got to be taken as a unit. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. And um, just talked about um, how Satan's goal has always been people, you know, because um, with any with any ruler, and the king of Sodom, we see this too. Uh, without people, you have no authority. Authority does not exist without people. All right, so he's not going to give any up. But there was more to this um, this parable than than just talking about Satan. Yeshua is actually talking about their own political history. Why are Herod and the Romans in charge in the first place? Well, because of a civil war between the grandsons of John Hyrcanus, um, the great-grandsons of Simon the Wise, the last surviving brother of uh, Judah Maccabee. Although Simon was a wise and just prince, and John Hyrcanus was an effective ruler. The leaders after him, who called, who actually called themselves kings, were as brutal, petty, and bloodthirsty as any tyrants the Gentiles had to compare them with. Aristobulus I actually starved his mother and brothers in prison so he could take the throne. His brother Alexander Janaeus was so bloodthirsty that he crucified 800 Pharisees, his own people, forcing them to watch the murder of their wives and children all while he was having an orgy to celebrate the defeat of his political enemies. Although there was a brief season of peace when he, when he died and his wife succeeded the throne, his sons enmeshed the kingdom in such a terrible civil war upon her death as they battled for the throne that Rome finally had to intervene once and for all and they installed Herod the Great on the throne. Needless to say that the Romans might have someday conquered the area again, but they hardly, they hardly had to lift a finger, okay, at that point with all the infighting. The responsibility for the destruction of the short-lived reconstituted kingdom under the Hasmonean heirs was entirely the fault of Jewish infighting. Sadducees versus Pharisees. And they knew it. And so Yeshua is throwing it back into their faces. Do you really think that Satan would fare any better than our ancestors if he were to fight against himself? But not only were they, you know, daily living with the consequences of a divided kingdom. But there was still bitter infighting going on between the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians who had very little in common except genetics. Even the Pharisees were divided into two schools, those of Hillel and Shammai, and they were constantly fighting for dominance over various issues of observance. The Jews were as divided as they were accusing Satan of being. And Yeshua was flat out telling them that there would be grave consequences, which would be all too clear um, come 66 of the Common Era when the Romans finally decided enough was enough and, uh, you know, fought a four-year war to put an end to the Jewish rebellions. And they thought, once and for all, they thought. Um, of course, that would only really happen after the Bar Kokhba revolt, you know, finally getting rid of these rebellions. But their refusal, the Jews' refusal to love one another and be united cost them everything. 
the temple would be destroyed and jerusalem would be remade as a fully realized pagan city ilea capitolina uh, was is what they named that city and and we all know how long they were gone before they were able to reclaim israel just the last century right and still there's nothing but strife in the region israel today is as deeply divided you know it's still a deeply divided nation of jews ranging from completely secular to ultra orthodox it's a hard issue okay israel needs to be united around god nothing else works uh you know not even the uh, best administration or or the most brilliant minds i mean, don't get me wrong there's no civil war going on amongst the jews right now they are they are deeply divided religiously so i mean you know we talk about denominations in christianity well where do you think we got that from <laughs> all right there is nothing new under the sun these these divisions and the infighting so but at least they're not killing each other okay they're not doing that so yeah yeshua is insulting their accusations saying that their own history shows that their logic is beyond flawed and now here's the second parable verse 27 but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then indeed he may plunder his house very short parable but also a very vivid picture and i want to point out that this is the only place in mark's gospel where he explains how and why he can deliver people from demonic torment so at one at one point he managed to bind satan not collaborate with him it never says exactly when this happened mind you but only that he is bound I'm inclined to think that this happened at the end of the wilderness temptation because after that is exactly when Yeshua began to perform deliverance on people and when the demons started crying out when they saw him. We certainly have, you know, no stories in any of the Gospels about them doing any of this stuff before. Now remember, do you remember when they referred to Beelzebul? Lord of the house? Well, the last parable had two references to a house and so do this one the strong man satan is obviously master of his own house unless he encounters a stronger one now the stronger one aka yeshua jesus bound satan in the wilderness in my opinion and then immediately went off to capernaum to the synagogue and began teaching and amazing everyone there with his authority an unclean spirit inhabiting the man cried out against Yeshua in the synagogue, and Yeshua set the man free. This was his first miracle, according to Mark. Satan had already been bound, and perhaps this is why Yeshua was led by the spirit into the wilderness in the first place, for the express purpose of binding Satan. Then he went out like Joshua and Caleb, driving out the enemies, but not driving out people saving people from the true enemies so it really shouldn't surprise us that deliverance is the most often mentioned miracle in the gospel of mark this is the prime job pre-crucifixion of yeshua as the yahweh warrior defeating the spiritual enemies who are oppressing his people the reason why he was crucified wasn't because he was threatening the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. It was because he had bound Satan and was looting his kingdom. What's the loot? People! We're, we're the loot. Let's go back to Isaiah 40 again. In verse 10, Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him he will tend to his flock like a shepherd he will gather the lambs in his arms he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young here we have adonai yahweh the lord god with his arm ruling for him now remember the great isaiah scroll found among the dead sea scrolls said that this arm is the messiah he is returning to zion jerusalem with his spoils of war 
aka his people. This is how Mark portrays Yeshua's mission, to herald the kingdom and to despoil Satan's possessions. Also, let's look at Isaiah 53, the suffering servant song. This is verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. More talk of spoils. This is battle language in the wake of the servant's victory. If you recall, when I taught about the uh, Yahweh warrior about six weeks ago, I mentioned the Melchizedek scroll and the testaments of Levi and Zebulun where the Yahweh warrior is clearly portrayed as binding Beliar. There are some very, there is some seriously deep roots on this stuff, folks. Yeshua is systematically dismantling Satan's power structure and chokehold on humanity. If it isn't clear enough at this point, it certainly would be as when paganism throughout the Roman Empire started to be replaced with monotheism birthed at the cross of Christ, syncretism and militarization would not begin to occur for hundreds of more years. But the early church turned the world upside down in a hurry. Regardless of what happened centuries later, Rome fell to Yahweh and his Messiah. Verse 28, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatsoever blas whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Now, people ask me all the time, and all teachers, all teachers get this, all pastors, all teachers, you know, they get the question all the time if they have accidentally blasphemed the Spirit. And people are really worried about it sometimes. I used to reassure them that it was pretty much impossible, but I have reconsidered my position. I will tell you what. The scribes here were sure that this guy who offended them so much and who disagreed with them on so much and who taught in his own authority couldn't possibly be allied with Yahweh. Could they point to an actual gross sin? No. They really just didn't like him and what he was saying and how he was saying it. They even had come up with a convoluted reason as to how he was working all these miracles. Beelzebul was behind his power. But these good works weren't exactly supportive of the demonic agenda, which is to you know, steal, kill, and destroy. He wasn't pointing anyone toward any other gods. He wasn't telling anyone to set aside even one jot or tittle of the Torah. Just some people's interpretations of it. Yeshua wasn't getting rich doing what he was doing, but his every action seemed to be a judgment of their lifestyles. He ate with the wrong people. Oh, oh, the horror, you know? <laughs> He pronounced obvious sinners forgiven. He performed non-life-saving acts of mercy on the Sabbath and in the synagogue, no less. He touched a leper and he wasn't even a priest. Ew. He was just altogether the wrong sort of person. He wasn't an elite. He was from Nazareth. It was a shameful thought to even contemplate a prophet would finally rise up. And it would be this guy of uncertain parentage. His disciples weren't learned men, but tradesmen and tax collectors and stuff like that. They didn't like him. They didn't like what he was doing. They didn't like what he was saying. They didn't like how, how he was doing and saying it. He didn't show the proper deference for scribal authority. Good gracious, he did not come from Judea, or so they imagine. Yeshua here begins with Amen, which is generally translated into English as truly. Uh, in the Bible, Amen or Amen or Amen or however you want to say it, 
it's, uh, it's spoken in order to affirm someone else's words, usually God's, but never one's own words. Yeshua is the only person in scripture who says it in order to endorse his own words, and he does it 13 times in the Gospel of Mark. That's actually huge. It's almost akin to saying, I am. So we know that he's deadly serious about what he's about to say. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. And this actually says, what in Greek it says, whatever blasphemies they blaspheme. So we do a double down on the blaspheming here. This isn't just blasphemy, this is blaspheming blasphemy. But still, it will be forgiven. Whatever slanders people speak about Yahweh or Yeshua or you or me, all forgivable. But, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Make no mistake, when they looked at these miracles and said it was Satan, they weren't just slandering Yeshua. They were one, saying that Yahweh was not intervening and keeping the promises spoken through the promise, uh, prophet Isaiah. And two, that these works didn't strike them as particularly being representative of Yahweh's character. It was like they were looking at Yeshua and saying, No, I know what the God of Abraham, Isaiah, and Jacob is like, and he isn't like this guy. I don't see any family resemblance. The doctrines are all wrong, and he's criticizing us and not the Romans. This is a warning to all of us. Just because we don't like a messenger or how they operate their ministry or whatever they preach or whatever, we must never, ever, ever claim that their works of healing and demonic deliverance are the acts of Satan. Yeshua says Satan doesn't operate like that. He doesn't set people free. He only enslaves them. Now, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, right? Romans 8, 29. God calls people and gives them gifts, and even if they distort the message or go seeking after money, they still have that spiritual authority and can deliver people of demons and heal them and perform miracles. But we can't just go off and say it's the devil doing it now. That's attributing the good and wonderful works of the Holy Spirit, working through a, you know, even extremely flawed vessel to the enemy. That's blasphemy. Blasphemy means slander. We don't give the enemy credit for how the spirit moves to, he to deliver and heal because maybe we hate the vessel. We must always be finding ways to honor the spirit of God and not slander. And you know what? Sometimes we're just plain wrong and there isn't anything wrong with the messenger at all. We might just not like the theology, but it might end up being superior to ours. Or maybe they have details wrong that offend us, but their walk is a hundred times superior to ours. And the spirit loves flowing through them to the people to do the work of the kingdom. Sometimes our biggest issue and malfunction about people is that they have the audacity not to be enough like us. But that's just petty tyranny and self-worship. You know, it's setting ourselves up as a sort of idol. So, we, uh, we looked at the penalty for blasphemy against the Spirit. What about the perks of acknowledging Yeshua? Let's look at the somewhat parallel account in Luke 9. Uh, Luke 9, verse 8, And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Again, we have uh, the warning, you know, about not blaspheming the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness available to anyone who slanders Yeshua. But this time we get a promise of being not acknowledged in high places if we acknowledge him here in low places. 
Low places meaning on earth among human beings, great and small. That's the flip side. Yahweh wants our obedience and rewards us for it. He isn't just one of those ancient Near Eastern gods who punished for non-compliance but wasn't really in the rewards business except for their own personal favorite pet humans. So, you know, be on the safe side and don't do anything inadvertently. Label the Holy Spirit as a demon, okay? Be humble. If God can work through you... When so many people disagree with you and don't like you, then he can he can and will work through people you disagree with and don't like. We need to get over ourselves. I mean, we seriously need to get over ourselves. Heck, he's seriously slumming, you know, to work through even the best of us, which isn't you or me, that's for sure, okay? I mean, the best of us isn't you and me, right? Okay, one more verse. Isaiah 63.10. It is a humdinger. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. There we go. No forgiveness for those who rebel and grieve the Holy Spirit. No blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This goes back to the prophets, folks. It does. Now, I want to tell you what, um, cause we talk, I, I talked about the whole, uh, if you deny me before men, when you get one of those internet things that says you have to forward this poster <laughs> because if you don't, then you're not claiming Yeshua or Jesus or whatever. And if you don't, then he will deny you before the angels of heaven. That doesn't count. That's just silly. That's manipulation. That's someone who wants shares. Okay. That's, that is not cool. You know, but I'm one of those people that says, you know, something, something, something. I bet no one will share this. Yeah, they're right. I'm not going to share it. I, I wouldn't want to prove them wrong, right? <laughs> I refuse to be manipulated like that. But I want to talk about something that just happened on my friends list a few weeks ago. Oh, my gosh. So I see this woman, and she, she posts that her husband is, I'm not making this up, she posted that her husband is Michael from the book of Daniel. You know, Michael the archangel, the prince of the people. That her husband is Michael from Daniel and that everybody had darned well. Oh, and she says, she says I don't just think he is. I know he is. And I, I want people to really, you better be careful in how you respond to this because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin. And I'm going like, all right, I'm telling you right now, you need to know this. Uh, that is just messed up. That is twisting scripture. That is manipulating people through fear. But also, if I got on that thing and I said, you know what, sis, there is just no way your husband is Michael the archangel. And even if I was wrong, blaspheming the spirit you know <laughs> oh people 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 come on i don't like it when people misuse scripture like that to shut down questions to shut down opposition it's a uh, it's such a horrible thing to do to people and, you know, not everyone studies the scripture at a super deep level. And that kind of stuff can really easy, man, easily manipulate people who are not well versed. And also, you know, frankly, people who have been abused by this sort of manipulation, a lot of times they're more susceptible to it. You know, and, and I'll tell you something. I pity this girl that she thinks that her husband, who... um is Michael. I, I pity her. I do. Um, but I'm not going to support her. You know, there's all kinds of people out there, folks. Anyway, um, gosh, I will, uh, I will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>